Can you see my screen, Emily? Yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. Yeah, it should be a good mix of people from like all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, PRing maybe a little bit too much. And like the Wilderness Medical Society just picked it up and the third on their Instagram the other day. Yeah, I saw the saw their logo. So that was yeah, cool. they're officially sponsoring me. <laughs> nice, good work. Yeah, cool stuff. All right, should we start Let's admitting people? Do it. All right, here we go. Yay. Hi, everybody. We're just going to give everyone like a minute to join and then we'll get started right at 5 p.m. All right, we're gonna get started while everybody starts kind of trickling in. Welcome to the Wilderness and Emergency Medicine Lecture Series being hosted here at UM and by me. Before we get officially started, my co-moderator, Emily, is gonna go over some rules. So Emily, you can take it away. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. We have an excellent speaker today, so Shelby will be the one to introduce you to them. Um, in the meantime, we're asking that everybody, please, um, if you're willing to turn on your cameras, you know, the more the merrier, uh, but we're not going to kick you out if you have it off. Uh, we do ask that everybody please rename yourself with your institution at the end of your name, um, just so we can see like where people are from and see what a diverse crowd that we have today. Um, we're really excited to have everybody. We welcome all questions if you want to put them in the chat. Um, and I and Shelby will be looking through the questions and bringing them together for our speaker at the end. Um, and yeah, feel free to put things there. Otherwise, please keep yourself muted. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to also direct message me or Shelby. But thank you all for coming and we're really looking forward to having you. Yay. So um, just a quick um, who we are. So as Emily mentioned, my name is Shilpi Ganguly. I'm a second year medical student at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. And why I feel like I can do any of this, I'm currently on the executive boards for our emergency medicine and wilderness medicine interest groups. And I'm also on the leaderboard for women in aerospace medicine, which is a subsection of the National Aerospace Medicine Student and Resident Organization. I'm the person that kind of created this project and, and presenting this lecture series. And I'm super duper excited to have you guys all here. Big shout out to my logistics team. Um, Emily, you just met her, is here today helping me out. We have a super big exam coming up on Friday, so I'm extremely grateful that she's here helping me out. Um, for my new faces and for my speakers every week, I kind of just like to go over this slide. Um, I created this project for two reasons. Um, I think the obvious reason is to expose interested students to the breadth of wilderness and emergency medicine. Um, I personally think uh, wilderness medicine is badass. And with such diversity, I kind of wanted to create an opportunity where students could learn and engage with it well beyond the constraints of the environments in which we are surrounded by. And then I kind of secondarily and on like a deeper level and with this ongoing pandemic, I just wanted to create something that reminded honestly myself and all of you why we got involved with medicine um, in the first place. Um, kind of just to show the diverse spheres in which physicians can make an impact and inspire hopefully you guys to start thinking abstractly about the ways in which we can utilize our careers in healthcare and medicine. Um, so what to expect if you didn't know, now you do. We're here to learn about expedition medicine. Next week we have medical talks followed by dive medicine to round out the year. 
but don't fret because I have a super packed lineup for next semester um, and I'm still adding more. So all the most up-to-date information can be found on my website. And if you hadn't have a chance to look at it, we will link it in the chat for you guys today. Um, I mentioned this last week, but just a quick reminder, I now have a resources page on my website that I'm continuously updating with things that can help you all remain engaged with wilderness medicine beyond this speaker series. Um, so feel free to check that out. And if you, any of you have anything that you think everyone might benefit from, please feel free to send it my way so I can get it onto the page. And so with that, uh, the reason that we're all here, it is my pleasure to introduce one of my favorite people and mentors, Dr. Ryan Patterson. Dr. Patterson is board certified emergency physician at St. Joseph's Hospital in Denver, Colorado, co-founder and former director for the Wilderness Medical Society Diploma in Mountain Medicine course and United States delegate to the International Society of Mountain Medicine. Dr. Patterson completed his medical education at the University of Vermont, his residency in emergency medicine and his fellowship in wilderness altitude and ex expedition medicine at Denver Health Medical Center slash the University of Colorado. Dr. Patterson has advanced certifications in tropical medicine from the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and in mountain medicine. His significant experience in large race event medical management, serving as the medical director for Global Limits, as well as in expedition medicine, where he served as an expedition doctor on Mount Everest. He serves as the medical director for the Kolkata City Mission, working to establish sustainable development solutions in education, health, women's empowerment, and more for communities in and around Kolkata, India. And so with that, please join me with silent virtual claps to welcome Dr. Ryan Patterson. Thank you, Thank Shilpi. You. Stop sharing my screen. We will start here. Thumbs up, Shilpi. Looks good to me. Well, hello everybody. Thank you, Shilpi and the University of Miami uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you guys. It's nice to see uh, nearly 200 of, uh, of you virtually. So uh, hope everybody's hanging in there at this time. And uh, let's, uh, let's talk about some fun things that definitely get me excited and uh, uh, in the realm of expedition medicine. So Shilpi, thanks for your nice introduction and for organizing uh, this fantastic uh, course. That's pretty, pretty awesome. And uh, Emily, thanks for your assistance. So again, uh, so I'm Ryan Patterson uh, and I guess I consider myself an ER doctor. Uh, most important things to me though are my family. And, uh, and then this stuff, which is spending time outside. Uh, so a few photos of myself, but as Shilpi said, I'm an ER doc. Uh, I, I do a lot of uh, work in the travel and tropical medicine realm, uh, as well as in disaster medicine uh, worldwide. Uh, and uh, as Shilpi said, I work at the University of Colorado, uh, as well as for Kaiser Permanente uh, in Denver, Colorado. And then I do a lot with the Denver Health Program and the residents there. Uh, the you know, I, I guess my passions are really uh, as an altitude researcher and a guide. Uh, those are those are the things that that I love that really get me excited. And I really want to take this time to give you a glimpse into some of the things that I do and some of the things that you all can do uh, with medicine and uh, in a way to mix your profession with your passion. And so, uh, just a couple photos of myself. So I want to start with a case uh, because I think we're going to sprinkle in a few bits of medicine throughout uh, this slideshow of hopefully fun pictures uh, and experiential learning. But a few of these cases, obviously, we can't do a great give and take uh, with as many people on the call and being virtual. But I do want to give you a sense of the breadth of what expedition medicine is and entails. So there we were at Camp 2 on Mount Everest, uh, and we were about 21,000 feet, and a 40-year-old male came in complaining of nausea and vomited. Not an uncommon occurrence on Mount Everest, but then we asked some more questions, as we do, and uh, the patient had loose stool for 10 days. 
also not uncommon with the diet uh, that we're all eating up there of dal and bot and, uh, and all of the oil uh, that we add to our food to try to maintain weight. But then he said, you know, I've had these small white worms in my stool. And we all looked at each other and we said, wait, is anybody else having the same symptoms? And sure enough, four other individuals in this patient's camp also had worms. And we looked at each other and we said, what? Worms on Mount Everest, 21,000 feet? And then we started reading again as to what, <laughs> what kind of helmets are we dealing with here? So long and short, uh, this was a small outbreak of hookworm. Uh, and so on this couple of the individual's feet, uh, they had these little burrowing marks uh, on the picture you see on the bottom here and some really gruesome pictures of the teeth on these hookworms uh, in, the, in the top left of your screen there. Uh, obviously not this patient's stool, but on microscopic analysis, the cysts uh, that, can, that can happen. And so this is one case that is odd from expedition medicine, but I have many more uh, to come. So expedition medicine has taken me to amazing places. Uh, this was on the north side of Everest in the Tibet region. I was there with a Sony Pictures production as the doc for their film crew uh, and actors and directors. And the far left of your screen is a place called Pong La Pass, uh, which maybe many of you have been to, but uh, it's actually where Mallory and Irvin got their first glimpse of Mount Everest, which you can see in the background there. Uh, it's now covered in prayer flags and just a very, very beautiful and peaceful place. Uh, as we traveled more closer to Everest, we passed many monasteries uh, with their holy uh, goats and beautiful old doors, uh, which countless, of, countless monks have traversed through. And the amazing ingenuity of people to create rice paddies in the heart of a high altitude plateau desert. Uh, it's pretty amazing. So beautiful, beautiful place. And as we got to the Rongbuk Monastery at the base of the north side of Everest, you can see Everest buried in the clouds there at the, at the head of that valley, uh, but not a lot there, very different from the Nepal side of Everest, which is where most people approach. And our companion yaks, uh, beautiful steadfast creatures uh, who can somehow survive uh, without supplemental water uh, in this environment, unlike ourselves. Uh, they eat the snow to obtain their water. And then figuring out how to get your stuff uh, into this place. And these are, these are our food stores, as well as our tents and medical supplies, along with some film crew uh, gear. What takes is one. You got it, brother. You got it. You got it. You know it. You know it. You know it. That's it. Oh, it's just as one. And then finally the clouds cleared and you get an amazing view of the north face of Everest. And uh, just, just an unbelievable sight since to stand there in the majesty of the tallest mountain on the planet. And knowing that I'm there to care for humans as a doctor as an expedition provider, uh, such a privilege. And just some cool photos. But there's nothing there. And the closest medical center was 36 hours by yak and then foot and then SUV. And maybe if we were lucky, we might come to a clinic that had some capabilities. And so this, these are the challenges uh, that present themselves in these environments. No CT scanner here. And so one of our directors actually uh, woke up in the middle of the night uh, with oxygen saturations in the 60% and breathing 40 to 50 times a minute 
And this was her, the altitude profile uh, of the beginning of our trip uh, that you can see along the right there. And uh, uh, this, is, this is a case that we've, we've published, but interesting enough, uh, we were multiple days in before she developed her high altitude pulmonary edema. And the question was, now what? Uh, given that we were 36 hours away from any definitive medical care, we had a finite supply of oxygen, and how are we going to treat this patient? And so fortunately she did well and we were able to get down to a low enough elevation that she was able to uh, regain her ability to oxygenate uh, and most of her pulmonary edema cleared uh, fairly quickly um, as we came down in elevation. But challenges as to what to do and when and how quickly uh, face you at every turn as an expedition provider. So what, what is an expedition provider? And I, I'd like to define it uh, maybe in uh, just so that we're all on the same page, but I think this, an expedition provider is a provider of significant training that is in direct care of a specific group uh, of patients and likely in extreme environments and without definitive access to care. And so it, it really epitomizes what wilderness medicine is and what can be done uh, in the extremes uh, in our world. So what credentials do you need? And you know, I'd love to make this a give and take conversation because it's, it's always fun to hear uh, the different acronyms and the things that people feel are gonna be most useful uh, to the expedition provider. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of folks start with a wilderness first aid certification, uh, which is a couple day course where you learn the basics of what is wilderness medicine. Uh, some people then go on to do a wilderness first responder, a wilderness EMT. Uh, some people start to attend the Wilderness Medical Society uh, events and trainings and gather more and more knowledge. Uh, but the, the credentials that are key uh, for an expedition provider are actually going to be in what is known as the Diploma in Mountain Medicine. And the Diploma in Mountain Medicine has become the international certification uh, that's been more or less agreed upon as the basic standard for expedition providers. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that is, but, um, but you know, the training uh, takes you to pretty, pretty cool places and helps you realize, you know, what, what you actually need uh, to do in order to provide expedition medicine. All right, so what, what's in your medical kit? And this is a lecture in and of itself, uh, but I think the long and short is that your medical kit uh, the answer is it depends. And it depends on the availability of community resources. It depends on the duration uh, that you're gonna be gone. It depends on the number of participants that you have. It depends on the environment in which you're going. Uh, it depends on activities that you're going to be doing. Depends on the amount of money you have. Depends on the weight and who's gonna be carrying that weight. Is it gonna be a yak? Is it gonna be a donkey? Is it gonna be yourself? Uh, and then ultimately, how are you going to accomplish this? And so I give lectures on medical kits uh, all the time and I would love to provide a list, but the problem is there is no list. There is not just one list, there are plenty of lists. And uh, in talking with Shilpi over the years, uh, she knows that I have many, many medical kits and the kits range in size from a few pills and band-aids to massive expedition medical kits uh, that can be placed on a yak and carried on a glacier. So, uh, so what's in your medical kit takes practice, it takes learning, it takes reading, uh, and it takes thinking through a lot of the things that might occur while you're on expedition. So how do you get those supplies? And so I wanna make this as practical as I can uh, for everybody, but I think the challenge is how do you get these supplies? Um, as a hospital employee, uh, you can't just go to the stock room and, and take these, uh, these pieces of equipment. Uh, you can't 
prescribe the medications to yourself uh, and go and pick them up at the pharmacy. Uh, all of these have ethical implications that make this a big challenge. Uh, and so there are, there are agreed upon ways uh, that we can actually stock our own medical kits uh, with the supplies and medications that we need. Uh, my recommendation is actually to form a good relationship with your own primary provider, uh, make a phone call ahead of time and say, hey, I'm the expedition provider for this group and I need to take these medicines. Would you be willing to write me a prescription that I can fill that says directly, these are for dispensing only and would you be willing to do that? And uh, a lot of providers, I think, uh, come alongside you and will help you with that. Uh, I do that with my personal provider. And then the two of us, while we're sitting in the office with the prescriptions being written, uh, actually call the pharmacy lead or the director of the pharmacy and explain what's happening. And then I, I never use my insurance for this because that would be insurance fraud. And so the important things are to pay cash, uh, to have a paper trail and to do this uh, following all legal and ethical uh, regulations and recommendations uh, that are out there. It's a brief foray into how to stock your medical kits uh, and one person's opinion. Um, but uh, you know, in 15 years of doing this, I have yet to run into a problem. Um, and it's all then prescribed uh, in a way that I have paperwork uh, that I can travel with. So other countries and customs agents uh, almost never give me a hassle. But how do you get to go to places like this? That's everybody's question when they talk to me about how do you become an expedition provider? And I think some of it is getting out there, getting your name out there, doing this more and more. And the question is though, where do you start? And so where do you start to get yourself to places like this? And the places that you start, you start with the certifications. Once you start to gain the knowledge, then people uh, start to ask you to come along. And often it starts with friend trips. Uh, I know a number of you are climbers. Uh, it starts with friend trips and uh, personal trips to mountains, to exotic places. And you start to hone your experience as to how to pack these medical kits and what to bring and what do I need to prepare for. And you start to hone that experience to a place where then people start to refer you uh, to, to others who are taking bigger expeditions. And this is the path that I've taken, and it's, it's one that, you know, fortunately has worked out, um, and I realize the privilege that I'm in, uh, that, it, uh, that it is not necessarily a common path, um, but it's taken me to amazing places. This is a picture of a ski expedition in Japan uh, a couple years ago. But I also then forayed myself into research. And so the, uh, I did a lot with Rob Roach and Peter Hackett uh, with uh, you know, the study of altitude uh, based out of the University of Colorado. Uh, we partnered with the University of Oregon and we ended up in Bolivia uh, for the summer. And this is uh, from my bedroom uh, actually in Bolivia uh, at a hut um, at about 16,000 feet. And so, you know, watching the sunrise and the alpine glow hit the top of a peak uh, in your office uh, is, a, is a pretty remarkable experience. And then of course, climbing, 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 uh, something that I love. Uh, if you can see the small little ants on the top of that mountain, uh, you know, that's our, that's our rope team. Um, I'm the one at the very front. Uh, if, you can see that, but also in Bolivia, but you know, when you're not doing the research, you can actually be playing and experiencing the physiology yourself. And it's a pretty amazing privilege. So another case. So your tent mate begins complaining of a headache, uh, nausea, fatigue. 
seems to improve throughout the day uh, doing acclimatization hiking uh, and climbing and seems to be worse at night. So the question is what's, what's going on here? And this is a case of mine from Alaska. And this actually turned out to be carbon monoxide poisoning. And so this, this person actually got evacuated. We all thought for a while there that it was high altitude cerebral edema, but it didn't seem to make sense that it was getting better during the day and had been kind of cycling through for two weeks like this. And, uh, and so ultimately, you know, I can't take credit for this, but a, a smart buddy of mine uh, said, you know, maybe, maybe this is something else. I think this person probably needs to go to the hospital. And, uh, and so ultimately, despite them looking fairly well, uh, we actually sent them uh, to Anchorage and their CO level was quite high. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting because this brings the front country medicine, the emergency medicine into the back country and, you know, helps you figure out uh, some of these very, very uh, strange cases. So this is a climbing uh, expedition to the Dolomites. And fortunately in Italy, uh, I know many of you have been there, you know, there's plenty of hospitals nearby. So hard to say this is truly expedition medicine, but, uh, but as the doc on the trip, you know, you definitely are prepared uh, to cover things for that hour to hour and a half until there's definitive care. but just beautiful, beautiful places. So everybody always asks about insurance. So how do you practice medicine in the backcountry? How do you practice medicine on Mount Everest with the international team of climbers and actors and directors and, uh, and uh, filmmakers? And the, you know, how, do you, how do you come up with a plan that's going to cover your malpractice. Who are you going to be sued by? Who's going to, where's that case going to arise? Uh, and is it going to be in court in Germany? Is it going to be in court in Argentina? How do you find some sort of insurance policy or some way to protect yourself? And this, this area is as clear as mud. Uh, there is, there is no plan. And so the difficulty is you try to protect yourself as best you can, um, but, uh, but it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, I partner with a group uh, and I actually have a medical, uh, EMS medical director's insurance policy um, and that covers me for any pre-hospital care that I deliver anywhere in the world. Um, now, that said, uh, <laughs> If there's a lawsuit that gets brought in Germany, then it's going to be a challenge. Uh, but my policy specifically states uh, that they will pay reparations no matter where in the world uh, this uh, case is brought. And, uh, and the group I partner with is pretty fantastic and they actually provide the medical insurance for wilderness medical directors through the Wilderness Medical Society. So. Uh, any, any member right now of the Wilderness Medical Society is eligible uh, for that. Um, and then I uh, kind of beefed up my plan with them personally. Uh, but, uh, but it's not, there, there is no great answer uh, for this problem. Um, but case law has shown that the majority of expedition providers are typically not gone after because most clients realize that you're doing the best you can with limited resources in a very limited environment, uh, in a very extreme environment. And so uh, very few case law uh, precedents have been set for suing or going after an expedition provider. So at some level, I take some solace uh, in that and maybe right or wrong, uh, but do the best I can. So then it takes us to Peru and I love Peru and I love uh, the Corderia Blanca, uh, an amazing part of this world uh, with mountains like this. And I would argue that it's maybe more impressive in my mind uh, than the Himalayas. Uh, it is 
amazing how many uh, six to 7,000 meter peaks are just smashed together in such close proximity uh, that you could climb you know, more than one uh, in, a given, in a given trip. Uh, so pretty, pretty incredible. This is where uh, a partner of mine and I uh, have founded the Diploma in Mountain Medicine of the Andes. Uh, and so I stepped out of, uh, after co-founding the Diploma in Mountain Medicine uh, for the Wilderness Medical Society, I stepped out of running that a couple years ago and focused on a continent that does not currently have a Diploma in Mountain Medicine. Uh, the Diploma in Mountain Medicine was founded uh, in Europe in 1997 and has gradually become the international standard for what it means to be an expedition provider. And that diploma, uh, you know, in the United States, we think of diplomas as everyone gets them for playing soccer. Uh, but uh, in, in Europe and a lot of the other places in the world, uh, a diploma is actually a big deal. And, and this course typically is about a three to four week course, um, very, very intensive, you know, 40 to 50 hours a week uh, and a lot of experiential learning in the high alpine uh, glaciers, cliffs, um, high, al high altitude rescue, uh, high angle rescue, um, and what it means to put together and prepare and to be an expedition provider. Uh, our goal in founding this in the Andes and the Cordillera Blanca is actually to found it, to get it up and running, and then hand it off uh, to, uh, to the Peruvians and uh, the medical providers in Peru and coupled with uh, Patagonia. So uh, pretty, pretty fun. Uh, the first round of this course, uh, a trial run was done two years ago. We were supposed to run it this past summer, and obviously uh, COVID hit. So uh, this, this coming summer will be the first, uh, first actual full course uh, provided travel restrictions are lifted. So uh, very, very cool, uh, but um, just an amazing part of the world. Uh, we'd love for any of you to join us. So check out our, check out our website there. A little shameless plug, but, uh, but super, super fun. And then you get to climb in places like this and learn mountain medicine. but just beautiful mountains. Quite, quite pretty places. Hopefully some of you get a chance to come or have been there. Uh, this is one of the most unique uh, rock climbing places that I have ever been, um, and it's just outside of Huaraz uh, in Peru, in northern Peru. And, you know, these rock formations are incredible. Uh, it's, it's a type of granite, but ultimately this was an old volcanic plug uh, that eroded. And these, these rock walls are 200 plus feet tall. You can see the cows are those little black dots on the right uh, in the field there, uh, just for a little perspective, but, uh, but just, you know, brilliant places. But we do a lot of our high angle training for the diploma course in, uh, in this environment. And so very fun and get to do some climbing while you're at it. And then this is one of our uh, acclimatization climbs. Um, so watching the sunrise on the far mountain there. So what, what, what do you do before an expedition? And what does that look like as an expedition provider? And so, you know, it, it seems like, okay, great. You know, you get, a you get to travel to all these beautiful places. And, but, you know, you have to remember that this is a job. It is, it is something that, you know, typically your trip is covered. Uh, it's free travel. Maybe you're being compensated at some level. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of plus or minus, um, but, you know, getting the privilege to go to these places and to care for people uh, is, is really what, what drives me to do this. And so before the expedition is actually the time when you're the busiest. And this is the time when you need to screen the team members. You need to make sure that you're thinking about all of the things that could arise from their basic medical problems and normal medical needs 
and prescription medication, uh, you know, uh, side effects or withdrawal potential. Uh, this is the time when uh, you need to task team members to be responsible for their own dental checks because a broken tooth or a busted crown can ruin an expedition. This is the time when all participants need to go have their eye exams and to have an extra pair of glasses and multiple pairs of contacts uh, to, keep, uh, to keep their eyesight going while you're on the expedition. This is the time uh, when you need to task participants to get their prophylactic medications and prescriptions for the treatment of basic travel-related illnesses like diarrheal illnesses, your nauseas and your vomiting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is the time when then you need to complete a risk assessment. So what, it, what does it mean to complete a risk assessment when you're going to Mount Everest? Very risky. What does it mean when you're going to the deep jungle? Very risky. What does it mean when you're going on a sailboat um, for two months? Very risky. So how do you actually do that? And that's, that's where you need to come up with a system uh, for yourself as, as, to, as a checklist to think about the things that you need to think about. And so this, this includes investigating local health services and medical facilities and what are their capabilities? How do you get there? Uh, what is the plan for evacuations of any kind? Maybe it's a small broken bone on a finger. Maybe it's a larger uh, mid-shaft femur fracture. Maybe it's somebody with appendicitis. So what, what is your plan for evacuation in these places? Um, once you do that, then you need to think about a communications plan. If you're the only provider, do you have radios? Do you have cell phones? Do you have satellite phones? How are you going to actually communicate with teams high on the mountain who may have a medical need? How are you going to get people evacuated if you're the only provider and you have another 40 people who are remaining uh, on the mountain or in the jungle or up a river uh, as you work to evacuate a single patient? Uh, so coming up with an organized communication plan is part of the pre-expedition work uh, that varies in, in entirety depending on where you're going. Uh, and then, you know, again, organize and set up medical evac insurance. And so each participant, when you're going on a true expedition, should have some degree of medical evacuation insurance. And this not only protects the person, but it protects their family uh, from a potential bankruptcy as these fees uh, will get passed down to other individuals of the person's family uh, if they need a medical evac flight uh, from you know, Africa back to the United States uh, has the potential to run over a million dollars. And so uh, these, these type of risks are real. And so the thing you can do when you're helping your buddies uh, initially or your clients eventually uh, come up with how to protect themselves and their families, uh, medical evac insurance is a cheap uh, way to do that. Um, and then Ultimately, study up. What are the infectious disease risks? What are the travel medicine risks in the place where you're going? Uh, if you're at 21,000 feet, I'll tell you, hookworm was not on my differential. Uh, and, you know, and so, but my work as a travel and tropical medicine doc um, training at the University of London, uh, the London School of Tropical Medicine, I knew that that was a potential and I knew what to do about it. But gaining all of that experience is of utmost importance. Any questions on kind of pre-expedition work or planning? We're getting a lot of questions in the chat. I think we'd love to run some of them by you yeah, at the end of this if we save some time. Absolutely. Is it okay to ask a question um, just out there? Yeah, let's just do that because uh, the chat is always hard to see for me. <laughs> yeah, we were gonna, we are keeping an eye on the chat and we'll okay. go through all the questions at the end with you too. Okay, yeah, that, yeah. that'd be fine. Or we can so, just ask them as we go, either yeah, way. Yeah, either way. Yeah, feel free to jump in if somebody has a question right now. Should 
Shivani, yeah. do you want to share? Yeah, you had one quick one, right? Sure. Um, sorry, I just my video oh, off, but um, I have a little bit of a bad connection. But I wanted to ask you. It sounds incredible, all the things you've experienced. But thank you for making the time to talk to us today. Um, what would you say are key things to keep on a differential or keep in mind if making a voyage to like Antarctica? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, unfortunately, Antarctica is one of the places I have not been fortunate enough to travel to yet. Uh, however, it's on my list and maybe Shilpi and I are going to go uh, climb there at some point. But, uh, but I, I think, you know, the uh, most people who are going to travel there are going to be more than capable to prepare themselves for the cold. Um, but, mm -hmm. uh, but things that people often forget is that the most common illnesses on expedition are gonna be the GI uh, related illnesses. So those are really gonna be your traveler's diarrhea. You know, how are you going to, we'll talk about this in a second, but how are you going to prevent that? How are you going to treat the water? Uh, where, where are you going? Uh, are you relying on snow and the melting of snow in order to maintain hydration or, you know, these kind of things. Uh, most people are prepared for the cold. Um, and then obviously, you know, animal bites and stings uh, are going to be a much lower uh, risk for you. So you might consider upping your gastrointestinal treatment uh, supplies in your medical kit and maybe downgrading your bites and stings and those kind of things. So you know, kind of just some basic, basic thoughts there. Uh, depends on what you're planning to do. If you're going to go dive under the ice, then maybe you need to consider, you know, how, what's your evacuation plan for hyperbarics? Um, what is your, you know, plan for decompression illness? And so a lot of the things that you learn about in wilderness medicine may or may not apply to the environment in which you're going. Uh, but you have to think through that in a very systematic way. Uh, the form, the format that I use is I uh, typically go through, uh, I go through location, uh, just any inherent dangers there. Then I go through infectious disease, any inherent dangers there. Then I go through environmental, any inherent dangers there. Uh, and then I specifically work on evacuation plans for minor, moderate, and severe illness uh, or injury. Uh, and that's the format that I typically use uh, any, any time I'm planning on these trips. Hopefully that sort of touches what you're, what you're asking. Thank you so much. Yes, definitely. It's relevant to my, myself and some others and I really appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. Where are you guys going? We're going, we're preparing for a trip for um, some data collection and stuff for Antarctica, but it's a, nice. a while yeah. away. So yeah, I'm really excited, but also want to be me uh, medically prepared, mentally prepared, everything. Thank you. Totally, totally. Yeah, I've got a I've got a buddy who was doing some research at the bottom of some lakes in Antarctica, and um, the uh, so drilling holes in the ice, diving, um, and then the water samples they were pulling out of these lakes um, actually were teeming with bacteria, um, which. Uh, was was thought uh, would probably uh, create a pretty significant diarrhea if one were to drink it untreated. So, um, so interesting enough, you know, even being a cold place, uh, you know, water treatment still is relevant. So then during the expedition, so this is a lot more of the obvious stuff uh, that I think, you know, people really think about as an expedition provider and what it means to be an expedition doc. But the, uh, these, these are the things where you have to realize that you have limited resources. You only have the things you brought with you. And I always, I always say to trainees and people that I'm teaching uh, that you know, the best first aid kit is the one that you have with you. Uh, it doesn't matter the amazing first aid kit you left at home. Uh, that doesn't help you in the middle of the backcountry. That doesn't help you on expedition. So the only first aid kit that matters is the one you have with you and it's limited. So you need to remember that, you know, if someone has a big wound, you don't open 47 packets of gauze. Uh, you try to make do with as few as you can because you might need them in a subsequent day. So, uh, so just remember that your resources are limited. Uh, honestly, during the expedition, the biggest thing is you often become the bad person. You become the bad guy uh, because your job is to keep people healthy. 
And that then requires a whole lot of public health. That requires reminders to wash hands, that requires reminders to, you know, uh, put the toilet, you know, 100 plus yards from camp. That, that requires, hey, let's wash those pans one more time uh, with some soap this time and let's make sure they're really clean. Uh, so you often become the bad guy uh, on expedition because you're the one who's focused on public health and keeping people, uh, keeping people healthy. Uh, and the best way to do that is the public health uh, realm. And then the next thing is, when you go on expedition, be proficient at the activity. Don't be the doctor who shows up and can't climb. Don't be the doctor who shows up and can't paddle the whitewater. Um, don't be the doctor who shows up and can't do the 10 mile hike uh, with the patient who needs to be evacuated. Um, so point being is be proficient at the activity for which you're going. Um, and you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be the best. Uh, just don't, you don't want to be the person to hold people back. And so uh, those are just a couple points during the expedition as a provider. Um, so train your mind, but also train uh, your abilities uh, to do those activities. So then people often forget as expedition providers that there's an after the expedition. And so often there's stressful events that occur during an expedition, whether it's interpersonal relationships, whether it's true psychosis, uh, whether it's an injury, whether it's a death. Um, all of these things have happened to me at some point. Uh, and the after expedition debrief and following up with individual participants to gauge mental health, to gauge you know, personal uh, grieving uh, and interaction back into life are all continuations of the expedition. And we have to remember that as expedition providers, we have some role in that as well. Um, it's not, hey, expedition's done, see you later. Um, so, uh, you know, remember that these are your patients and at some degree, there's a longitudinal aspect to this. Uh, it also, you also have to follow up with your participants because there is travel related illness. And so you need a plan for what are they gonna do when they develop a fever three days after returning home from the island of Sao Tome off the west coast of Africa? What are you gonna do? What are you gonna tell them? Uh, you know, is that your responsibility or not? Um, and, then, uh, and then ultimately, I think always just a quick check-in a week or two after the expedition and, and just see how people are doing. And, uh, and I think ultimately, you know, that's, that's where the expedition may end, so. So speaking of Sao Tome, uh, so this, this is a, another type of expedition. So this is a, I, I'm the medical director for a group called Global Limits who run some pretty fantastic ultra marathons in Bhutan, in Cambodia, in Albania, and in this island called Sao Tome, which is actually the second smallest African nation. Uh, and it's about 200 miles off the west coast of Africa, right on the equator. A beautiful, beautiful place. I'd never heard of it uh, until our CEO said he was going to run a race there. Um, but just unbelievable uh, beauty and the people are fantastic. Um, but you can see where our camp was here. Uh, this was, it's a stage race typically. So a few, uh, few days into the race, this is where we camped. Just in the trees there, just so beautiful, untouched beaches, just amazing. And then there's these volcanic plugs on the island, which uh, you know this one's uh, this one's almost uh, 3,000 meters, uh, which is unbelievable. Uh, and so it's only been climbed twice. So those those of you who are climbers out there um, might uh, might take a look at that. But how do you keep this race crew healthy? How do you maintain hygiene? how do you help runners who have been sweating and blowing their nose and using the bathroom in the forest um, and eating their food that they brought along with them uh, for the last three days and then you get to this camp? How do you keep this crew living in close proximity healthy? And so 
Uh, these are the challenges that face expedition providers. Uh, and so you can see uh, off in the very top right corner, there's some blue uh, boxes that you can sort of barely see, but those are latrines. Um, it is about 100 meters uh, from the edge of the camp. Um, and the food area is right in the center of camp. So as far away from the latrines as we could uh, rightfully make it. Uh, and then we put into place uh, lots and lots and lots of options for hand sanitizing and washing hands. Uh, we actually have a, a bag system for uh, washing hands. So excuse me, a, a bucket system for washing hands uh, that the World Health Organization has used uh, throughout the world uh, in various difficult conditions. Um, but we, uh, you know, we require all of the runners to wash their hands on entry into camp and then after setting up camp and then prior to getting the boiled water for their uh, dehydrated food. And so three times anyway, before they go to sleep at night. Uh, and then we ask them obviously after using the restroom to wash their hands, but some strategies that have been in place, uh, you know, for a long period of time, and it's very basic, um, but it, man, it takes so many reminders. And so I park myself often by the hand washing station and everybody who walks by, I'm like, hey, do you wash your hands? Hey, do you wash your hands? And so really, really glamorous as an expedition provider, but, uh, but it's how I keep people healthy in our, our rates of diarrheal illness have just absolutely plummeted in these races. Um, we only had three uh, individuals during this race actually develop a gastrointestinal uh, syndrome. So, um, and hard to say that was due to infection versus just the conditions of running in the heat, but, um, but quite interesting. Just some more pictures where we, where we camped. So a case, so 34 year old male with mosquito bites in Sao Tome. Now his fever is rash. Um, the rash was present, but now it's faded. Some muscle aches, joint pains. What am I? Sure, you guys have seen a lot of this stuff, but this is dengue. Uh, and so actual cases like this of real tropical medicine. And what do you do? How do you treat it? Uh, and do we need to be concerned? Obviously, this runner was quite concerned. And, uh, and then how do, we, how do we deal with this in Sao Tome, which has one clinic on one side of the island with four beds and no medicines. So uh, how, do we, how do we deal with this? And so, um, you know, things to think about before you end up in a very remote place. This is our, this is our, this, actually, this is September of this year. And uh, so in the midst of a pandemic, my CEO from Global Limits called me. He said, can we do this? And I said, yeah, we can do this. And so we brought people from 16 countries in the middle of a pandemic to Albania, which had very relaxed travel restrictions and a very low incidence of uh, infection and a very low R naught. And we uh, put in place some pretty amazing restrictions on people. Uh, we gave everybody one tent. Uh, we put their names on it. So they had one tent for the entire six day race. Uh, we had, uh, you can see in the center there, there's three small blue buckets. Potentially you can pick those out. Uh, those are, that's our hand washing system. Everybody in camp all the tents were actually set up nine feet away from each other so that when they got out of their tent, they were still six feet away. Uh, and all of this was, uh, was done. And then every night when our crew took down the tents, we actually sanitized the entire inside and zippers of all the tents uh, by hand before we packed up the tents. The racers were all wearing masks, obviously not during the run, uh, but right when they finished and then throughout the night uh, until they got into their tents and then first thing in the morning uh, and lots of other things that became, you know, that are very familiar to a lot of us uh, in medicine, but from a public health standpoint, uh, pretty basic. Uh, and we had everybody tested before the race and everybody tested after the race and we had zero cases of COVID. So, uh, I consider that a success. Uh, we also had 100% of the runners finish, which has never happened in one of my races before. So I think 
public health actually works. <laughs> and uh, and that from an expedition standpoint, I think if you are the bad guy and you put in place some of these public health mechanisms, um, I think you can actually keep your entire expedition pretty healthy. So just some cool pictures from Albania. But the Albanian Alps are unbelievable and uh, a lot like Croatia was probably 50 years ago. Just some really cool places. So then you have a 26 year old who's running and gets mauled by a dog that runs out of the forest. So what do you wanna ask her? Was it provoked or unprovoked? Are your shots up to date? Tetanus, rabies, what allergies do you have? So then the question is what treatments do you provide? What treatments did you bring? What treatments do you have? How many doses of this? And so these are all questions as expedition providers, you have to be prepared to answer. Do you suture it? Do you not? These are all wilderness medicine questions that have been debated for years. So then do you evacuate them or do you let them continue the run? Um, and how do you decide? So all, all very fascinating questions, but the breadth of knowledge is sometimes uh, very intimidating uh, because there are, you know, travel and tropical medicine topics. There are basic ER and basic medicine topics. There are wilderness medicine topics. And then you get into, if you're doing race or extreme environment uh, type events, you know, the heat illnesses and the hyponatremias and the cold illnesses. And uh, so it's the breadth, the breadth of knowledge, um, and I don't pretend to hold it all in my head, but the breadth of knowledge is real. And so this is why gaining as much experience and as, as many certifications uh, and learning from everybody uh, will only serve you well if this is the type of medicine you wanna provide. So then what else can you do as an expedition provider? And so these are some of the things that I've been able to do, but I, was, I worked uh, with New York City medics and I was on the ground two days after the Nepal earthquake. And I felt called to this because uh, of all of my friends in Nepal uh, that I've met along the years after climbing there for so long um, and actually living there for a short time. But the, uh, and I felt the call that I had to go and help. And so, uh, you know, this is our gear and we're flown by the Indian army um, up to the Tibet border and um, dropped off in a rice paddy at about 12,000 feet. And then navigating earthquake terrain on the left there and suturing and fixing this lady's crush injury. Um, she'd been buried for almost a day uh, after the Nepal uh, earthquake. Um, and then just talking with people about their experience and the fear uh, that they had following this event. Um, and so just really, really amazing things. But as climate uh, is changing, I think you already heard from Dr. Lemery, um, but uh, as climate is changing, you know, more and more natural and man-made disasters. And so, you know, the skill set of a mountain and expedition provider, uh, along with some travel and tropical medicine and, and basic uh, skills as a, as a physician or a provider in general, uh, can lead you to some pretty, pretty cool places helping people uh, in these type of disasters. This is our intensive care unit. And so basic things of shade and cushioning for the patient and then the medications that we had with us. Uh, I then went with uh, the UN uh, to Iraq um, uh, just, uh, just a year and a half ago now and uh, you know, set up some pretty makeshift clinics uh, on the front lines, but, uh, but it was it was quite an experience uh, and you know, a place where, again, you're resource poor in extreme environments um, where you have to learn to use your resources uh, the best you can uh, and uh, help people uh, in these really tough situations. 
but my favorite expeditions are with my family. And these are my two girls, uh, my wife and our amazing dog. Uh, it's about 4,300 meters in Colorado uh, this past summer. Um, so just super fun. Um, but these are, these are my favorite expeditions uh, these days. And you better believe that I have my first aid kit, especially with this crew. So what questions do you guys have? Let me pop out of this here. Well, Dr. Patterson, we actually had a lot of questions coming in for you. Um, and I've done my best to sort of organize the ones that everybody sent in. Um, everybody's question has been viewed and I tried to incorporate it into these different categories that we have. Um, but I think first and foremost, a lot of people had a really pressing question specific to this yeah. talk, which is, why did that person get carbon monoxide poisoning in Alaska? What, what was it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So very, very pressing question for sure. Um, so if you burn anything uh, in a closed space, you are at risk for carbon monoxide. And this individual was high up on a mountain ridge and had all of the zippers of their tent closed uh, with very little ventilation and was cooking with a propane stove. Gotcha. Okay. The cooking happened <laughs> at night and the headache happened. And then during the day when they're outside their tent moving around in the fresh air, oh, the headache went away. And then <laughs> repeat that night. All right. Another question we had that was specific to your talk um, was what were the circumstances that improved the chances for survival for that person who had the high altitude pulmonary edema? So the, the number one thing I think you're gonna hear uh, about more kind of high altitude medicine in the, in the, in the new year, but, uh, uh, but you know, really the, the biggest thing is, the, uh, is, is going down. And so if you decrease the elevation uh, and you do it rapidly, uh, you really don't need to go far. Uh, it's really only about a thousand meters and you can see a real dramatic shift uh, and fix uh, of, of the pulmonary edema. Okay. Yeah, that's really important. It's nice that it's such a fast fix kind of. Yeah. Um, other questions that we started to have have to do with sort of your daily life and balancing being an expedition doctor as well as, um, you know, a, a family person who loves to go on his own personal expeditions. But yeah. um, so generally speaking, like how does planning for all of these big expeditions impact your daily life and how, how do you sort of manage that, that balance? Yeah, you know, great, great question. I, I think my favorite word is balance. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it, it really helps because I have a, a saint and a amazing wife uh, who, uh, who makes the statement frequently, I know this is you, uh, you know, I love you, you should go. Um, and, uh, and, and not said in a mean way at all, definitely said only in a supportive way. Um, and so I, I think that helps. So finding the right partner, um, I think, is key. Uh, secondly, you know, trying to balance the family expeditions with the extreme expeditions are things that I, I focus on. Um, obviously, after kids, I think the, uh, the severity of the expeditions, you know, has, has declined slightly. Uh, but again, you know, still getting to some pretty amazing uh, remote places. Uh, as an expedition uh, provider. Definitely. And generally speaking, do you find that um, you're staying up to date for the newest and latest wilderness and expedition medicine helps you in your clinical practice? Or how do you balance keeping up with those two things? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, uh, it's fun. I, uh, you, you guys haven't talked about cold stuff yet, freezing illness, I don't believe. Not yet. That's coming up Not next. Yet. It's coming. Yeah. Okay. It's coming. You know, it's it's fascinating because maybe just a preview, but you know, some of the treatments for frostbite, for example, are going to be thrombolytics, um, whether it's intraarterial or it's uh, or it's IV, and so seeing patients in the emergency room in the front country, uh, and knowing some of the some of that literature, uh, it's actually interesting because some. Some uh, expeditions to Mount Everest are now taking thrombolytics uh, with them uh, for the treatment of frostbite in the field. And so it's, it's pretty fascinating how some of this stuff is, is really cutting edge and moving from the front country to the back country. Also, treating patients with hypothermia and true hypothermia 
or cerebral edema from altitude or high altitude pulmonary edema and seeing them in Denver, um, it helps me recognize some of these things are not a stroke, are not a meningitis, but actually a high altitude cerebral edema from the last week they spent at 14,000 feet in Colorado. Uh, so some of, some of these things uh, are very translatable both, both directions. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, we have another sort of general category of question that several people were asking. I think a lot of our audience might be medical students or people who are in the medical field and wanting to go further with it. Yeah. Um, so they're wondering for the students, I guess, um, how would they make themselves better candidates for these sort of wilderness medicine fellowships and uh, emergency medicine residencies in the future? Yeah. And for anybody else, just what are the sort of like opportunities that might not be like as well known that you would strongly recommend that yeah. they pursue? You know, I, I think, uh, yeah, broad question. So probably, probably the best place to start is to follow your passion. And, and so I, I think whether that's mixing medicine with the passion or following your passion, I, I think those are, those are super important things at, in the fields of medicine, because I think a lot of us get very inundated, you know, with, with the medical literature and with uh, learning to be a doctor and then your practice and the intricacies of, of your practice. Uh, you know, maybe it's the business aspects or maybe it's just the day to day uh, going to the hospital and working. Um, I think sometimes people forget uh, that they have these passions uh, that can help balance life. And so back to that word balance, uh, which I find to be so important uh, in allowing me to do the things that I do. Uh, so I think number one, follow your passion. Number two, find that balance uh, where you can still have your passion and be a really excellent clinician. Uh, so I think those are very general, but um, but you know if we maintain focus on those, I think it's possible to uh, really excel. Uh, the the type of activities that I would look for are the ones um, you know that where where you can where you can gain knowledge, but also go to these fantastic places. And so there's, there's some really great wilderness medicine uh, activities that can be signed up for through the Wilderness Medical Society, through the University of Colorado section of wilderness medicine, where we take undergrads to Costa Rica, to Nicaragua, where we take people to the uh, backcountry 10th Mountain Division huts in the high alpine environment in Colorado. Uh, Dave Young, I believe, spoke with you guys already, but uh, Dave Young and I run a med student elective in wilderness medicine uh, where we spend a week in Rocky Mountain National Park, and then we spend a week in Moab, Utah in the desert. Uh, and those type of things you can look at the University of Colorado's website, um, but I think all of those classes and experiences will only help you meet people and set you up for uh, getting into this type of uh, activity. And to jump off that, on my resource page, I have links to everything that Dr. Patterson just mentioned. So feel free to go check that out. <laughs> yeah. And, then, and for those of you who are residents or uh, attendings or PAs or advanced paramedics, uh, the Diploma in Mountain Medicine certification is open for all of you. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's, you know, ultimately, if, if you really want to pursue this, I think having the Diploma in Mountain Medicine initials, the DIMM after your name, I, I think are uh, pretty internationally uh, recognized at this point. And on that topic, we had a couple of other, I think, quick questions related to that. One person asked, is the diploma in mountain medicine, um, would you say that that's uh, standard or the gold standard for non-mountain expeditions as well, like desert, jungle, ocean? Yeah, the, the, nice, the nice thing is I think the skills you learn there uh, will set you up for all of those other type of expeditions. Um, there are modules uh, that you can do in addition to the Diploma in Mountain Medicine that can set you up for, you know, kind of more jungle, you know, uh, type, type experiences um, where it focuses specifically on that environment. Um, but, but the Diploma in Mountain Medicine, even though it says Mountain Medicine, there is a big component of mountain uh, training, but 
but there's a whole lot uh, where it's basic expedition provider planning and, uh, and execution. Sure. And for those of us who are just looking into this, what do you think about the um, Wilderness Advanced Life Support Training? How does yeah, that I think, I think AWLS is fantastic. Um, I think it's a, it, you know, it definitely serves a really uh, good stepping stone uh, for people who have some medical training who want to take it uh, just a little bit further. And so I, I think it's, I think it's definitely a good stepping stone. And then enrolling in some, you know, whether it's Knowles or University of Colorado type programs to then practice that stuff um, would, would maybe be another, another move. All right. I'm going to hop so in. Much. I'm going to hop in. So we're about almost 10 minutes over. So I just wanted to take a quick second and thank you so much for giving this talk. Um, I do want to respect everybody's time. Um, we wrote down everybody's questions and I'm just going to pester you to maybe give us answers at some point when you get Sounds a moment. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. This was an amazing, awesome presentation. And at the very least, you gave us all tons of travel FOMO. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, much appreciated. Um, I don't want to keep you too late, but thank you everybody else for coming. I really appreciate it. And I hope you guys all learned something and have a great rest of your day. And yeah. Thank you all so much for listening. Out. I appreciate yep. the time. Bye, everybody.